Economics is about so much more than just money. It's about trade-offs. Should you watch another hour of Netflix or should you study? Should you come to class or should you sleep in? What should you major in? I mean, obviously, your future income is a big component of your chosen major, but that's not the whole story. You care about whether or not you find the topic interesting, whether or not you like the type of lifestyle that type of employment brings you, what your personal life mission and goals are. Economics cares about all of that. Of course, economics also helps us with how and where to shop or what's the best way to save. But understanding trade-offs and decision makings can help you in your personal life, for who to date and marry, as well as navigating fairly when and who should do the dishes, who's going to mow the lawn, or whether you're just going to have a native plant's lawn instead. Money is not the goal of economics. It's merely a helpful measuring stick. It can help us measure and compare costs and benefits. Our primary goal is the flourishing of human happiness. So if you have all the money in the world, but you cut down all the trees at the same time, you would have a poor economy. Well, how do we compare benefits and costs? Some things are hard to measure. Like you can't tell your friends, you're a $20 friend, but you're a $50 friend. Except in many ways, we do. You don't buy all your friends and family $50 gifts on their birthday. You don't spend every evening with every person you maintain a relationship with. Time and scarcity force us to make trade-offs. And these trade-offs and decisions force a comparison. We only have so many resources, so much time in a day, so much energy, so many goods and services to devote to things. But we can only allocate these things in one way. We have to choose. And this decision often is very uncomfortable, and many times it's not very clear what is the right thing to do. A big debate in society right now is how much healthcare should be provided in the last stages of life. Once we reach, say, age 92 and are in severe declining health, what should be done in those last few months? Should society pay for a very expensive surgery that may only extend life for another two months? Or should we focus instead on what's called palliative care, where we simply focus on alleviating pain. Rather than passing away while being stuck with tubes and machines, you pass away peacefully at home surrounded by your loved ones. Should those scarce resources of trained surgeons be used on the young and poor instead? More explicitly in terms of policy, should we spend more of our health care dollars in Medicare at the very end of life, or rather in Medicaid for the poor and young? We'd like to do both, but the limitedness of our resources requires us to make decisions. The entire economic problem is one of scarcity. It is when we do not have enough resources to satisfy all of our wants. We don't get satiated, which is just a fancy way of saying fool. After a few hours at the Las Vegas buffet, you're full, you go home, there's no economic problem left. Time is the perfectly scarce good. No matter how rich, no matter how poor you are, we only have 24 hours in the day. We have to decide how to spend each hour. Well, here's some trivia. If something is rare, is that the same as being scarce? So here we have a picture of a buffalo. The buffalo is rare, and it's also scarce. We spend a lot of our time and resources in preserving the buffalo. But can you think of something that's rare, something that's unique, but is not economically scarce? Something the society doesn't spend money on? My example is the wardrobe of pianist and entertainer Liberace. He had tremendous taste, a unique sense of style. No one looked like him. His clothes are one of a kind. His fashion is as scarce and unique as it gets. And yet, despite this, the Liberace Museum, which was located on Tropicana Avenue, just a mere mile or two away from the Las Vegas Strip, had to shut down. They didn't get enough patrons, despite their free shuttle to the museum. Not enough people anymore were willing to part with their scarce time and scarce money to patronage the museum. No amount of bejeweled cars was enough to create economic scarcity. What other types of things are not scarce? I've got a video game story for you. So after the tremendous success of the film E.T., Atari wanted to put out their video game before Christmas. The problem is, normally at the time it would take about nine months to develop a video game, they pushed this out in six weeks. And so, they created a terrible game. It's awful, go look it up. It's the worst video game ever. I mean, you can't even tell the pixels are even E.T. half the time. So all the kids got upset and they returned all these games and Atari couldn't sell them anymore, and so they dumped them in a New Mexican desert. Or at least, this was the urban legend. Well, in 2014, a guy tracked down where the spot was, got the permission, rented all the big machinery and equipment, and dug them up. Got about 1,300 of them confirming the urban legend was true. 
And he thought, because of the whole story, the press he was getting, that he could create some economic scarcity, and these would now sell as collectibles. He would auction them off. I mean, a, a couple were sold, but people still didn't want it. It wasn't scarce. Is a free concert a scarce good? What do you think? Pick one of these four. No, because there are no costs. Yes, because there are so few of them. Remember we just talked about rarity and scarcity not being the same thing? No, we don't have to give anything up yet. Or yes, because we have to give up what we would have done with our time. While many aspects of a free concert are not scarce, you just got the ticket, perhaps it's not even transferable. The fact that you have to choose what you do with your time means there is scarcity associated with the event. When we have scarcity, it requires a decision. How do we allocate our scarce resources? Who gets what? A lot of times we use the price mechanism to determine who gets it and who doesn't get it. If you see the price and you want it and have the ability to pay, you get it. If you see the price, decide you don't want it or can't afford it, then you don't have it. Now this works for a lot of things, such as fidget spinners, or dishes, or furniture. But it doesn't work for everything. Another mechanism we use is a government mandate. We do this, for example, with education. K-12 through education mandate taxes, we pay the salaries of teachers and administrators, we build buildings, and we also require children to spend their time being educated. Now there's still a lot of choice involved with that. A parent can choose where to live, what public school to go to, there's charter schools, there's magnet schools, but we also have private school options as well as the choice to homeschool. The United States was a pioneer in universalizing high school education a century ago and it is one of the keys to the economic success that the U.S. experienced in the 20th century. Often how we decide who gets what will be based on some sort of moral system. In the case of a fidget spinner we're largely okay with using the price mechanism but in the case of healthcare, it's different. Nearly every religion and nearly every moral philosophy says that basic human health care ought to be provided to everybody. Of course, there are active debates and disagreements on the quantity or how much, but nearly everyone agrees that if a person shows up to a hospital with a broken arm, they should get a cast regardless of their ability to pay for it. We can formalize the full cost of our decisions by looking at opportunity cost. This is what we must give up in order to get something. It is the cost of missing out on the next best thing. Opportunity cost arises because of the fundamental economic problem of scarcity. Scarcity occurs because of limited resources. And when we use a resource for a thing, it always means we did not use the resource for another thing. Therefore, all choices are a trade-off. So, you decided to come to class today, or watch this video. What was the best alternative that you were forced to give up as a result? What else could you have been doing? You could have been sleeping. You could have gone to work. You could have been playing video games. You could have been studying for another class. But you only could have been doing one of those things. Whichever one is the best, missing out on it, coming here is the opportunity cost of watching the video. So even though the video is freely posted on YouTube, we still face an opportunity cost when we do anything. Let's look at the question on whether or not college is worth it. Over four years, tuition at an in-state public university may be around $40,000. This will be more or less, depending on where you are, what kind of scholarships you have. But you also have to forego work. Now, say with a high school diploma, you go out into the workforce, you get $40,000 a year over four years, that's $160,000. This is, of course, assuming that you're not working part-time that would lower the opportunity cost of that. But let's talk about this third option. Part of going to school includes room and board. You need to pay rent and you need food. I don't know why they call food board. Anybody know? Is this an opportunity cost? Is this an additional cost if we went to school? Well, what's our next best alternative? The next best alternative assumed here is working. If you work, do you still need shelter? Do you still need food? Yeah. Y yeah. So therefore, the room and board cost, which is commonly included in the cost of going to college, is actually not part of the opportunity cost. We need food and shelter either way. Of course, there's some nuanced ways to look at this. Perhaps the cost of a dorm is far higher than the rent price you would pay elsewhere. Or maybe the location where you're going to school has a higher rent compared to where you would be living otherwise. And then, of course, you just adjust accordingly. So in this example, the total cost of attending college is $200,000. This means that the lifetime benefit of university education would have to be larger than $200,000. Taking into account net present value and discounting for the future, and what are the benefits of going to school? Beyond life satisfaction, quenching your curiosity, and other noble pursuits, on average, the lifetime earnings of a college earner are a million dollars more than simply a high school earner. 